This is a special review of one of NFO's Here's Info programs. It was played back for the women's meeting at the 1977 convention in Omaha, Nebraska, December 5th. As the ladies said when they met, we're full partners in agriculture and in membership in the National Farmers Organization. 1977 National Farmers Organization convention. I think it will be one of those more memorable ones. Although if you've been to every one since I have in 65, which one wasn't memorable, huh? There are a lot of familiar faces here and I'm glad to see that there are some people that I don't know. Those of us who come to the same national meetings all the time, we see a lot of friends from one year to the next and we're always glad to see those who haven't been here before. Those of you who have been coming to the women's meetings in other years will recall that the first few meetings we had, we had women from various areas of the organization geographically and also in terms of activity. We had those gals come before you and give some examples and some ideas of things that had worked in their areas. Last year we had uh, Mr. Fingston and we sort of got started into some nuts and bolts sort of things for the organization. And this year we've been fortunate enough to get launched a program in the counties that calls for a women's activities committee and I would hasten to add, we always say in the same breath, we do not have an auxiliary, nor do we want one. This committee is simply another committee, like the ones that we have had functioning to carry on the activities in the counties through the years. In keeping with this feeling of really integrating the activities and efforts of the gals into the basic framework of the organization. Tonight we are going to follow through into some more of the initial activities that will be taking place on into the coming year. Some of the things that will be necessary to be used in the areas to make NFO successful during these winter months when we have the opportunity to try to spread the organization's efforts and influence and abilities. Uh, the field staff fellows will be along later and some of the other people who we have on the program this evening will be from the PI department, Lee Elliott, Don Mack, Phil Allen, and one of our active NFO ladies in the AOM department, Anita Conklin. She will take a block of grain and show you where it goes, what happens to it, and helping the gals who are here perhaps to understand better uh, how commodities are moved. We will have uh, Shelley Robertson, I hope, later on. He is going to present uh, a very interesting phenomenon that happens in the market. and. Uh, as we go along, we will try to work these people in as we can, because some of them have other meetings too. In other years, we have sort of had this evening to ourselves, and this year we've been so jammed up with activities and so forth that we have competing meetings tonight, and so we have to try to accommodate each other, you know. Evidently, people are not aware of all of our virtues yet as an organization. We're not talking about women's lib, we're talking about farmers' lib and ranchers' lib, and we are farmers and ranchers, and so I tend to think of the gals as members. A lot of times when I'm talking to people, I don't make any distinction because there's none in my mind. We are all members, and as such, we have the rights and privileges and also the responsibilities. I doubt that any of the women who are here don't have some pretty definite ideas about that. So this is what we are trying to put forth this evening. We are trying to give you some ideas and some tools 
that will help you be effective as members back in the counties, whether you're men or women, just because you're NFO members. I think that it might be well to stop and think just a little about women as partners in agriculture. We share half of everything, including the mortgages and the FHA loans and uh, the deficits, those kinds of things. And we have a right and a privilege to help save this way of life that we have devoted most of our lives to, most of us. I myself was not a farm girl. I married a farmer, and uh, I think the conversion has been pretty complete. Phil said one time, oh, you're a convert. That's the worst kind. <laughs> so if there are any of you here who are not born and bred farm gals, that's all right. <laughs> it comes pretty naturally after a while. You're going to be privileged tonight to hear one of the gals who works in our AOM offices, area of office management, which is a sort of descendant of the old communication system, which a lot of you are aware of. Much evolution has taken place in the meantime, and those marketing area offices have been updated and streamlined and made into the kind of business offices that any corporation or any business would be proud of. And as Ornley sometimes says, when the shoeboxes ran over, we had to find a better way. And out of that need came these area offices and the tremendous amount of ability to handle commodities and handle paperwork that's so important. There are many gals who work in these offices. If there are any of them here in the crowd, I myself give you my thanks for the work that you do, and I think that the rest of the members feel the same way. It's the kind of a job that, well, I often say that some of the work in the counties, and I would say all the AOM too, it's like housework. It's not done and not noticed unless it's not done. And so, with that in mind, uh, Anita Conklin, who works in the California area, is going to go through a procedure that might seem kind of simple, and yet there are a lot of important things that many of the wives don't know about what happens to a block of production. And this is what we're here for, to learn what we can to help our husbands and help our counties when we get back there. So, Anita, if you would please. Doris mentioned to you that we are always going through updating and training, and that's why the office managers are in here this week. We've been in a training session. I came in Sunday night, and training session started Monday morning. And boy, have we been going through training. <laughs> they were saying talk louder. They were telling me not to talk so loud. <laughs> okay. I am going, to, I'm going to take a grain contract for sale of wheat, only because that's what I work with, grain I work with mostly. Most of your commodities are handled basically the same way that this grain program is. But I'm going to start with wheat. When you sign your grain up on a contract for sale, and we're going to assume that it is signed up in acres, it is mailed or brought in to the area office. At that point, the office manager reads through it and edits it. If there is something on there that is missing or it is incorrect, she will call you. When she calls you, she makes the modification, she verifies with you what is missing and should it be on there and how you want it stated. She hangs up her phone, she writes down a phone memo, and then types up a letter. This letter will verify her conversation with you and that she has added or modified 
your grain contract for sale per your instructions. At the same time, she sends you a letter acknowledging the fact that she has that grain contract for sale and it is in the office and into the system. From that point, that grain contract for sale, you have a copy, your office manager has a copy, and the home office has a copy. The modification letter, you have a copy, area office has a copy, and the home office has a copy. What I think is very important to recognize here is we're working on three sets of records, and this makes us really quite ac accurate. We're bound to catch errors. If you don't catch them, we can catch them. If we don't catch them, the home office can catch them. Okay, we've got, we've got grain in, in acres in section two on your grain contract for sale. Now, you decide you want to move some grain, a portion of your grain. There's two ways you can go about doing this. You can call your marketing area office and tell your office manager, your grain rep, your grain director, and they can write up a phone memo. Or you have a grain uh, sales authorization supplement that you can sign and mail into the office. Either way that you do this, it will be acknowledged by the area office manager in another form letter. And she, there again, it's acknowledged that you have chosen to move so much grain up into section one to be put in position to be sold. When it's in that position, then you will talk to your grain rep, your county chairman, and you will say, I want to block my grain and I want it sold. There's only one way that the office manager can block that grain, and that is through her grain rep or grain director, but it's through the authorization of the grain department that that can be blocked. When it's blocked, he'll come in and he'll say, block this grain. We go to our member jacket and we pull these documents. We are verifying that these documents are in order, they are accurate, and this grain is ready and can be sold. We write the block of grain up and we call it into the home office. They take down the same information that I have and they carry this information up to what we call inventory. These gals take the block and they verify that they have the information that can put this, that will make this grain available. If in all this traveling, any document is missing or something is not correct, that grain will not be blocked and it will go back out to the area office and say, they will tell us what's wrong, something's missing, or, but it will not be blocked. It cannot go to the bargainer's table until all the documents have been verified. So we're gonna assume that the block is correct and it has gone to the bargainer's table. When this grain is sold, the terms of the contract are typed up down in the bargaining room and sent back up to inventory. At that point, the original documents are pulled and this starts your contract folder. When they're pulled, the contract and the documents go to credit to be approved. When this is done, it goes back down to AOM in the home office. They call that sale back out to the field. We cannot release any sale information until we get that call from the home office, until we get what we call a transmittal document. And when they call it out and they give us our information at that point, we send you notification of this sale. Again, you get a copy, the home office gets a copy, and I have a copy. So at any point, you should be able to pull your records and have the same thing in your records that I have in my office. I have the same set of records that they have in the inventory department here at the home office. It's a terrific system, but it could work a lot better with more production. And that's all I've got there. Roger Schlotick is a fellow who's been around the NFO for quite a long time. 
I hadn't really thought of it until one day at the home office when we were talking about some of the uh, women there. And it dawned on me that Nancy Schlotick, she's a very intelligent gal, and he sold her, would you believe, the third time on going to work for NFO? I said, Nancy's the only three-time loser I know of. And if he could sell her on that, he had to be a pretty tremendous salesman. Roger had worked first in the communication structure, and at a later date, he worked in the home office in the meat department. He was head of the meat department for a while, and took another sabbatical leave, and then came back <laughs> into the field staff division. So you see, Nancy did have three chances to be a normal citizen, and he talked her out of it. So I would like for him to share with you tonight some of the things that uh, we're pretty excited about in the expansion for NFO this winter. Roger. What I'm going to talk about for a little while, we're going to break the, this portion of the meeting up into two separate parts, really. I want to talk to you about history for a little bit. Then we're going to get into what we're doing presently, what we hope to be doing the next couple of months. And I'm going to have Bob Arndt come up about in the middle of the presentation and go through a booklet, a manual that we have put together in field staff. Bob worked on this thing pretty much exclusively. We had some other helps on the graphs, but to put a manual together that you can use down the road in contacting prospective members. I, when I came back and came into the field staff department, <clears throat> was in 1975, and as everybody remembers, 1975 was the year that we were really fighting the Securities Exchange Commission, and the big fight was over whether the dues that were delinquent out in the countries were collectible or not. In their suit, in their suit against us, they said if we litigated every one of them, we would collect somewhere around 3%. So out of that, our backs were against the wall, as they say. We developed a system and out of that system has already come two other programs. What we learned in that, in those days back there in 75, in the summer of 75, we don't have any idea at this time where they're going to lead to. And what I'm talking about is, and many of you have been down the road before to try to bring current dues, or bring dues current, there was a big discussion as to whether they were or whether they weren't and whatever. What we simply done in field staff in 75 was we took that all down and asked one question. We knew if the guy was going to, where he was at, what we could do with him to get the situation corrected. But what we also found out was that if you take an idea, with that idea starting with one or two people, you take that, go in the home office or wherever, put the idea down on paper, that you think is going to work. Then you go out in the field with minimal manpower, one or two guys, and see if that thing will fly. And that's exactly what we done. We went down the road back then. We had an idea. We had a tape recorder laying beside us in a car seat. We had a pen. Well, after we made a contact, we'd see if it worked. And out of that contract, out of that contact, what worked and what didn't work. And after a series of contacts, you had a pattern develop. And out of that pattern came the approach that we used. Twelve weeks after we started that program, our boys jumped 500 percent in efficiency that were using it. And they jumped up to and were getting 27 percent of the dollars talked to on the first contact. 
that program was one of the things that helped us get rid of the SEC problem once and for all. Now, that program is still going on, but that's not what I want to talk about tonight. But I just wanted to let you know how that program was developed. And as offshoots out of that program, where we're at right now. About six months ago, we got a telephone call from a banker out in the state of Illinois. He asked us if we couldn't send an organizer out there to talk to him, talk to some of his non-NFO member customers. He said they've got a problem, and this was early on before everybody, all the publicity came out as far as the farm price situation the way it is today. Bob Arndt went out, held that meeting, <coughs> talked to that group of non-members, and out of that meeting came another meeting in Nebraska. And as the bankers start setting these meetings up for us with non-members, the businessmen start coming to listen what we were saying. And then Chamber of Commerce is here, there, and yonder start setting up meetings for us. And there was a discussion. A, re a relationship started to develop there, but because the businessmen were saying to us, well, like one of them told me, you know, if you guys want to go broke, that's your business. But you're taking me with you. I can't do anything about it. The government has provided you with the Capper Volstead Act. You've got the system in NFO to make Capper Volstead a reality. So why not go out and get it done? And we've got to do something to help. So what are we going to do? We talked about petitions. Petitions are fine. You get petitioned every day if you're in business over something. And the petitions wind up in somebody's closet, and that's as far as they go. The discussion came about, and through that flow of information came along the Certificate of Support program. How many in here have been aware or have worked with that program? <clears throat> okay. That is one thing I want to talk about tonight because that came about the same way as the dues thing did. Out of that idea, we took two guys, wrote down what we thought would work, went out in the country, and field tested that program. We compiled information off of every contact we made. It was funneled back into the home office every night. And after about two weeks of that and about 300 contacts, again, there was a trend. At that time, we took that program, we set it up, and we brought people in from the field, trained them at the home office, we held some training sessions out in the country, and putting management right there with those guys, with those people, staff people, to where every night they could get together and communicate with problems that they'd run into, and you see, after you develop a system like this, and management is right out there with them, you can modify if you have to, and you don't lose what you're trying to get done. So after a period of time of field testing, training, and that close management thing that we were using, we took it out in 21 states for a bigger field test, and that's as far as we got. That program is ready. We can use it as soon as we go home. But the important thing that we found in that program was that 44% of the rural businesses contacted solicited a certificate of support, 44%. All right, so what we done, we took that 44%, said, all right, that's 100%. That's all we got. Now, who are the people that are that 44%. Who are they? Are they doctors, lawyers, bankers, whatever? And we start breaking it out. And as our nightly reports come in, we broke them into those categories. 75% of those who took certificates of support were directly related, directly ag-related businesses, which is normal. The other thing that was interesting about it was the fact that it all depended on what stage the harvest was in, how many people had come in already trying to get loans for putting out the fall wheat, the winter wheat crop, as to how the lending institutions took it. 
it run from five to 90%. If the harvest was over, everybody took stock, what they had, started to looking at cost, production costs for next year, they went into the bank to try to borrow money, those bankers knew what we were talking about when we went in and started talking about a certificate of support. That certificate of support program has probably got more possibilities right now for what we need to do between now and the 1st of March than anything we got other than the membership agreement itself. And that program can be successfully initiated and carried out by the women members of this organization. They surpassed every man, every staff man, every place we used them on the certificate of support. And why is that? It's cotton pick and simple if you sit down and think about it. When we were on the farm, Nancy was the gopher. She'd go for this, she'd go for that. I went to town to get a haircut. I went to town, well, twice a year for sure, to go to the bank. I went in to borrow money. I never went to the grocery store. Very seldom did I ever go to pick up medicine from the vet for the cattle. Very seldom. They, didn't, they knew me, but they didn't have that response with me as they did with her. She paid the bills. If the bills weren't paid, they talked to her. And that's why it is so successful if you ladies do it. They're used to seeing you. They know you, and you are their bread and butter. And you can explain to them a lot quicker and a lot simpler with a lot less horsing around getting to the point than the guys do. That program will be initiated again after the convention. But look at the possibilities of that thing. Now, yes, it's a farm problem, it's our problem that prices are where they are. We have to do something about it. But you know, in every county, I don't care where you're at, there's a pecking order. And that pecking order in my home county is the smaller cattleman in a township look at the guy who's a little bit bigger than he is. And the, guy, the bigger cattleman in that township look at the county to see who's the biggest and watch what he's doing. Well, the bigger guys down there, the bigger producers, where do they look? They look to Main Street. And where does Main Street look? Where does you think Main Street looks? To the bank. So when you go in to organize for new members or work on the certificate support of support thing, that should be your first stop. Talk to him. They know what you're talking about. And remember what I said, 90% of the independents took a certificate of support because he knows what you're up against. They know that they're going to have to make decisions between now and the 1st of March, who does and who doesn't get it because there's so many dollars there to go. I talked to a PCA man a while back and he said, I'm really thinking about resigning. I said, why? He said, because of what I have got, the decisions I have got to make between now and the 15th day of April. Those people understand what our plight is because they're a part of it. And if we get that relationship established, and I'm not talking about going there getting a certificate of support, I'm talking about involvement in our problem. When you get the banker's certificate of support, ask him to come to your county meeting and talk about finances. He's supposed to be the financial expert in the, in the community. Bring him in and let him talk about it because then you start this information passing back and forth and the camaraderie starts to happen. If the implement man, if the, the feed man, the fertilizer man, the bulk tank man all have a certificate of support and they're out here talking to members and non-members, it's going to make him feel pretty good to know if he's a prospective member when he takes that step that he's not going to have to fight those peers that he works with every day. And he's not going to if we go out there and lay some groundwork. You eliminate it. There's very little of it left anyway. <clears throat> so out of that certificate of support, 
And I said, one thing leads to the other. Out of that certificate of support program, when that figure came up 44%, and we started breaking it out as to who it was, got to thinking, well, if 44% of the businessmen are willing to financially and morally back this organization with a certificate of support, exactly where are we out in the country? And I'd seen surveys all over. And they run from everywhere from 55% up to 70% of the farmers believe in collective bargaining. But which ones, where do you start? Who do you talk to first? So we took a couple of guys out and we put them out in the state of Colorado. We put a few of them out in South Dakota and put a couple of them out in Idaho. And we went down the road and made random contacts. Just bang, bang, bang right down the road. And we started taking down what their expression was, what they were saying to us, what age they were, and what type of produc production they had, what they produced. And we started to build an idea about going out on a massive membership drive this winter, 1 January. After we went out and got started, started making contacts in earnest as far as who to talk to, we found out that the most receptive people in those counties were 24 to 38-year-old farmers, people they don't know what this organization has got. They are my age and a little bit younger. They were 14 and 15 years old in the holding actions. We had 700 of those guys in Corning in the last three weeks from 17 states. And you know what those guys told us? We had them in the armory. Every department head got up and hit them five minutes on not philosophy. They know what our philosophy is. You sold them that. They understand that. They want to know, number one, does NFO have a plan? Number two, do you have the brains to carry it out? And what I'm talking about brains, I'm talking about people like Walt Hackney, Roger Blank in the hog department, guys who spent 30 years, 40 years in the industry. And I'll tell you what, you get 500 guys, 30 years old, 20% of them non-members sitting in the armory, and you get Hackney up there to tell them how he skinned them for 23, 25 years, whatever it was, when he was working for the Packers, they know what he's talking about. They're interested. They don't want to know what's happened in the past. We had a meeting there. There was a young guy. The first one we had was a very small meeting. We had staff in and this one kid from Wisconsin, and I saw him here today. And we got to talking about it, and there was, I don't know, 25 or 30 guys in that room, and he wound up being the only non-staff man there, the age category, and I was trying to get everything out of his head I could. The guy milks 200 cows. He's 29 years old, if I'm not mistaken. And the thing, we were talking around the room about what we could do and what we couldn't do, and things come up, you know, like what had happened back this time and that time and all that. And after so long a time, I said, Orrin Lee asked him, what do you think? He said, the first thing I think is that you guys quit the heck apologizing for what's happened 10 years ago. I don't care. He said, I wasn't part of it. He said, we expect you to have problems. He said, I've been farming for whatever many years he was, six or eight years. He said, when you start a business, when you start to farm, he said, if you don't have a problem, or if you don't have problems, he said, you're not going to get any place. When we got those 700 guys in there, they told us the same thing. We don't care about that. If you got the plan and you got the brains to carry it out, then tell us what we're supposed to do, and that's all we want to know, and then help us along the way. And those guys averaged about 30 years old. And that's where the future is at, people. Those guys got the same problems that you had 10 years ago, 15 years ago when you started this organization. <clears throat> exactly the same thing. We talked about it in field staff meetings today. I asked how many World War II vets were in there, and the hands came up. I said, how many of you guys, you know, when you came out, that's when, you that's when NFO was started, about seven or eight years after World War II. 
when the short-term chattel mortgages were up, which you did like I did, extended them a little for a year or two, so you had about seven years instead of five. They were up, you had to make those payments, and that's when your big land payments started. People, we're right back in the same place today. Exactly. It's come all the way around because seven, eight years ago, seven years ago, eight years ago this next summer, there was thousands of us came back from Vietnam and a lot of them tried to farm. There's some of them out there, yet there's a lot of us that aren't out there anymore. So we got the same problem you had, exactly the same thing. The only thing we got this time different than what you had then is we got a collection dispatch and delivery system to put that stuff through. You gave us a plan. You showed us how to do it. Now I'm asking you, we got to go one step further and that's finish the job. But what I want to talk about right now, I want to hand out some pamphlets. I want to go through this approach. Before we leave this convention, up in the field staff booth and in, his, in this building starting tomorrow morning, we have got applications. We want 500 county organizers. We've got, we need 500 staff organizers, pardon, staff organizers, not county organizers, to take, to go on field staff department set up the same way you had it set up before, on the staff, for expenses and a salary based on the draw, the same way you guys done it before. But now we know, putting those guys out there, we got the program, we're gonna go through it right now. We know who to talk to. You're not gonna have to run around and make 10, 15 contacts to find out the guys who you can get the ball rolling in the county with. You can zero right in on them and we can move this thing in three months time. Hutchison County, South Dakota. Anybody from there, here? How many new members did they get up there in the last three weeks? Okay, Dave was up there. Dave Benneke works with me. Do you know Dave? Okay, Dave went up there. How many, county, how many people were at your county meetings before Dave went in there on this thing, on the average? What was your last meeting? The, uh, 50? Okay. Why don't you get up and just tell them that real quick? Or you want me to tell them? <laughs> that county was running about eight to 10 people in their county meetings. Dave Benneke, an assistant director in the field staff department, took this program that we're gonna talk about into that county in 10 days signed 12 new members. The next county meeting, instead of eight to 10, there was what, 50 to 60? The hogs in that collection point, I checked in the hog department, jumped from 200 to over 500 in 10 days. Now, what was the difference? Those 12 new members, that's what made the difference. And every one of them are young guys the category that we're gonna be talking about here. That's one example. I can go to, to tell you the same kind of thing that happened in Colorado, the same kind of thing that happened in Idaho, every place where we've worked this thing. Okay, take this brochure, and on the inside, on the front, on the introduction, it simply covers what we've been talking about here for the last 10 or 15 minutes. Is that the right time? All right, we got, we go into page number two, and there is an option. You can either talk to these people by telephoning them and setting up appointments, and that's where the wives come in, making those telephone calls. Between 55 and 60% of them, if you call them and ask them for an appointment, and all you gotta do is tell them that NFO has got a new membership agreement, a one-year agreement, and we'd like to come over and talk to you about it. That's all you got to say on the telephone. And then set up a time tomorrow or the day after when you, when you can go over. 
You've already got your list of names. You put your list of names by county, by township in that county of these young producers. Then you get on the telephone and you call them and ask them for an appointment. And then this staff organizer is going to be out there helping, but then two guys out of the county or out of that township, preferably, go by and talk to them. And Bob's going to run through what, you, what they say and show you this manual. That's one option. The other thing you can do is, if you don't want to use the telephone, you can use the other method, which is slower. And that's simply jump in a car, grab you a handful of one-year membership agreements, and start talking to those guys in that township. And all you got to do is say the same thing as you say on the telephone. We got a one-year membership agreement. Take a look at it, and we'll come back and try to sign up as many as you can while you're there. But it's if you use the telephone, they're already ready for you. And there is no opposition when you go through this thing the way Bob's going to show you how to do it here in a minute. So that's the two options you got. But you got to screen those contacts. Let's zero in on the people who we can get started and get that ball rolling in the telephone with the ladies. Like I said, up on page four, that telephone call must be done by a lady. It makes it so much easier. There are the telephone preparation. What you have to do on the top of the page, down at the bottom, is the telephone approach that we suggest that you use. On the back is the approach itself that you use. And you can take the thing, you can fold this thing up and put that right on a clipboard and go out there and go through it by the use of this manual. The first thing you want to do is start talking about, and this is only a suggestion, this is what the staff guys use, this is what members who've worked on this thing have used. You don't have to memorize anything except three things, and we'll get into them in a minute. Number one, if you don't know him, you introduce yourself, and you start talking immediately about the markets, the prices. Now that is the most dangerous part of this whole approach because you'll get into talking about markets and prices and everything and you'll talk to him for an hour and completely forget about that you're there to show him that there's a way to correct it. Believe me, that happens. Okay. Then you bring it up that you've got to have a cost of production for your stuff, for your commodities. Ask him if he does it. And you're going to get an affirmative answer. Now, you're going for three affirmative answers before you start using the book. Ask him any time he has a chance to help himself if he wouldn't. And you're going to get another affirmative answer. Ask him if Farmers Unite, don't he think that they can provide financial security for their family? And every one of them will have to agree with that. That's three times. Now. At that point is where you need to have some certificates of support already out in your county. Because you can tell him then that X percent of the merchants on Main Street supported the organization and this is what they believe about collective bargaining. And now is the opportunity to help. And then the biggest thing you ask him, if you forget everything else, and that is simply, will you help? You ask him that over and over, and every time he comes back, Bob's going to go through that manual and show you every time you ask him, will you help? Now remember again who you're talking to. You're not talking to people who've got fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 worth of equity built up, and they can ride out a storm. You're talking to guys who are sitting on a quarter of a million dollars or more in interest payments, in principal payments, and they don't have the money to even begin to get that thing solved. That's who you're talking to. You're talking to us, to the younger farmers out there who are in trouble just exactly like you were 20 years ago and like you are yet today. But they understand you. Don't talk philosophy. Show them what we've got and where we're going to go, and then give them some leadership so they can help you get it done. Bob, I'd like for you to hand those manuals out. It's going to take a little bit. Can somebody help him back there? A couple of you guys grab some of those things. And Bob Arndt, one of my uh, cohorts. I always like to brag about Minnesota a little bit. 
Bob is from that state, that great state of Minnesota. And uh, I think that, that Bob has had as good a credentials as anyone. He's worked in the organization in a volunteer capacity and as an elected leader, as well as working in staff now. Okay, thank you. I guess the reason I, that they have me up here, we're going through this here booklet that was just passed out, but I will ask you not to open up that booklet yet because I want to ask you a question, which is uh, I'm not going to ask, have you answer it because I don't want it to be embarrassing. It's embarrassing to me, but how old were you when your county first chartered? If you think about that, in my county, I was 15 years younger than I am today. And those young farmers that are out there that are 30 years old were 15 young, years younger then. When my county chartered, a 30-year-old farmer to, that's 30 years old today was 15 years old in 1962. These are the young farmers that we're going to be talking to. And when we chartered our county and went out there and got new membership, how did we go out and get it? Did we try to get our neighbor to understand how the nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system worked? Or how the grain contract for sale worked? No, we didn't, because we didn't have it yet. But we still went out there and we, sound, we signed thousands and thousands and thousands of farmers. We fumbled around. We wrote a book through the years on how collective bargaining works. Today we have it written. We know exactly what to do, the steps to take. We've got the nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system. We got all the materials and the documents it takes to make it work. We've got the document control. We got the backup systems. It's ready to go. In the meantime, while we were doing this, in the past 15 years, we lost a lot of our old members. They died, they quit farming, they gave up hope and went off in different directions, but we, we got the leadership left in this country that's going to carry agriculture. Please turn the tape over to the second side. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the job that we have to do, to go out and point out to them what we have to offer. Do you know that farmers are not stupid? They're not dumb. They're ignorant. But I want to qualify that. I want to qualify that. It's not bad to be ignorant when you've never, ever heard from somebody the facts. You see, what people don't know, they don't know. My banker is ignorant about NFO, just like farmers. But what you don't know, you don't know. So therefore, you've got to be ignorant about the situation until you're being been told differently by somebody else. I was ignorant about NFO before somebody told me. So were you. And that's the situation with our young people out there from 22 to 38 years old. They're ignorant about the National Farmers Organization. Ladies and gentlemen, this little booklet here is going to change that situation. Because we're going to use this as a tool to go out there and show them exactly what NFO is all about. And the reason this book was written, and it's set up in such a way, and it's put together in such a way, for two reasons. Number one, to give that young farmer out there hope that something can be done, and secondly, to show him the method in which to do it. Now to take this book and after you've gotten the young fellow or the farmer to sit down at the table or in your car, and you ladies, you get in the house and sit down with that farmer and his wife, you can go through this booklet and you don't have to be afraid of what you're going to say next because it's all here. You're going to read it to them. You just page from page to page and that's what we're going to do. You take that book and set it on the table and say, hey, I've got something to show you. I'm sure, I know you're going to be interested in. Open it up to page one. Page one, it says, first, look at the, let's look at the facts about production and consumption. Now, these first six pages in here is going to give that farmer hope that something can be done. And I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to go through it very quickly because of the time involved tonight. But it's there. American dairy success, you point out to them and you read to them exactly what is on this page. Note that, that consumption has been higher than production in 1974, 1975, 1976. In other words, we've been producing less, we've been consuming more than we've been producing all those years. Why aren't you making a profit? Nationwide collective bargaining can make a difference. Let's move our milk together through nationwide collective bargaining. You're showing him that we have been consuming more than producing, so all that propaganda about overproduction isn't true. Point out to him that these facts come from the, U from the USDA, and it's on every one of these pamphlets. He can look it up. He can get it from his congressman if he wants to, but every fact comes from the Department of Agriculture. You turn the page. Show him about the red meat. We have, we have been producing less than we have been consuming. In other words, we had to import 
2 billion, 800 million pounds in 1976 just to feed ourselves because we haven't been producing enough. Why wait? Join your neighbors. Let's start bargaining. Turn the page. Grain. Here's the wheat. 1977 or 1978, we have the projection of producing 2 billion, 30 million pounds of wheat in this country. 11% is going to feed, 31% for domestic consumption, 49% to export, 7.8% carryover. NFOs propose 30% of the production being put together in one block. There isn't a one of these. The export can't get along without that 30%. Domestic consumption can't get along without it. The carryover is only 7.8%. And if we got 30% put together, sometime during that year, they're going to have to come to that block of 30%. That puts the farmer in a position to price it. What good is a flour mill without grain? 30%, then cost of production contracts or no production. You turn the page. Would organization help? Here's the total world, total grain supply over the past 1960 to 1978. 1960, we produced a little bit more than we consumed. In 1965, the world consumed more than they produced. In 1970, we consumed more than we produced. 1975, the same thing happened. 1976, it was almost balanced. 1977, 78, there's a projection that we're going to have more production than consumption, about 7% more, less than 30 days supply. If the American farmer puts it together, 30% of it, they've got to come to us for it, and we can price it. See what you're doing. You're showing him that there is hope because that overproduction isn't there. The fall of the American farmer. Now, we've just gone through all the pages and showed him that supply was less than the, and then the, the demand. But yet, from 1953 through 1977, the parity fell from 84% constantly until now it's below 64%. How much more will you take? You see, you read everything that's in this book while he's following, or she. You read it to him. Turn the page. Supposing, and this is, and this is a page in which you're going to get him in to, to answer an affirmative, and he's going to tell you that farmers can organize. He don't know it yet, but you're going to get him into that position. On page 8, you read to him. Supposing one person out of 1,500 owned 30% of all the beef, do you think he could determine his price to the other 1,500 people? Well, if he or she is thinking at all, they'd have to say, yeah, I guess maybe they could. Okay, then you say, supposing one person out of 1,500 owned 60% of all the soybeans, do you think he could de determine his price to the other 1,500 people? If one person owned 60% of all the soybeans and the other 1,500 had the other 40%, do you think that one person could set his price? They'd have to agree. Why, sure, if he owned that much, he sure could. Then you turn the page. He don't know what's happening to him. And here's the pincher. The U.S. farmer and rancher equals one person for every 1,500 people in the world. 60% of all the soybeans in the world belong to one person out of 1,500. Don't you think he could set his price? He already told you he could the page before, but now you're talking about him and himself. Now he's saying the American farmer can set his price. The U.S. farmer and rancher produces and is the first owner of 60% of the world's soybeans, 30% of the world's feed grains, 30% of the world's beef, 25% of the world's pork, 17% of the milk, 16% of the wheat, 50% of the world's corn. You show him these figures and it's going to surprise him because he don't believe it. He never believed that these were true. The USD Agricultural Outlook of October 1977. I was surprised when I seen it and you're surprised right now if you've seen it for the first time. We control the, the balance of the, the majority of the world production in our hands in this country. Now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of it. What you have done up to this point with this booklet is give that farmer hope out there that something can be done because we don't have an overproduction. We control so much of the world's supply that anybody who says we can't set the price, they're going, they've got to be out of their mind because we control 60% of the world's soybeans, a third of the world's cattle, a third of the world's uh, milk and hogs, half the world's corn, and we can't set our price. Okay, you put hope in that little young man, uh, that farmer's mind. Turn the page. Now we're going to give him a way in which he can put his price on it. On this page here, we've got four happy processing plants. We've got a lot of little green circles around these processing plants. They're the farmers supplying that processor in today's market. 
Unorganized farmers supply processors' needs on buyers' terms. Processors are comfortable, need not pay any more than they desire. That's just what's happening, isn't it? You'll have to agree, that's what's happening. The next page, just begin to explain to him what collective bargaining is all about. You get into a collective bargaining position when a group of farmers join together and sell their production selectively to a buyer in enough volume so that the other buyers can't fill their needs from their regular sources. Then before we sell to the other buyers, we negotiate contracts with them for higher prices. Does that make sense? Now, he maybe didn't follow you. He maybe won't answer in a positive way. If he don't, you go over it once more and get, come back with the same question. Doesn't that make sense? The second time he's going to nod in an affirmative. Yeah, I guess. And then you go, if a buyer can't get his needs from his regular sources, he will raise his price to attract the production or sign a contract to guarantee his needs. Don't you think so? Wouldn't you? And if he's following you, he's going to have to give an affirmative. Yeah, I guess. And if farmers are doing this on a nationwide basis, don't you think the buyers would be forced to negotiate with the organized farmers nationwide? Well, maybe. He maybe hasn't been following you here, but you're going to get him to understand it on the next page because you're going to tell him the same thing in pictures as what you told him in words the page before. Here we have an NFO organized block of production that's going to one-fourth of the processors in the country. Organized farmers in a position to bargain. Here we've got three unhappy processors and one happy one. The unhappy processors are saying, hey, what do I have to do to get some of that supply? You see, we blocked enough production and took it away from the other three and send it into the 25% the the or the other one. Organized farmers do not leave enough supply in the old marketing system for the other processors to fill their needs. They must then negotiate with organized farmers for part of their needs. You turn it over. How do they negotiate? The NFO bargaining representative backed up with NFO members' production has a contract which covers cost of production plus a reasonable profit who is offering that contract to the processor in, the, in need of NFO members' production. That's the whole story about National Farmers Organization and collective bargaining. You get the processors into a position where they've got to have the block, part of that block of supply, then our negotiator goes to the processor, offers him production, backed up with NFO members' production. Processors will negotiate contracts with producers only when they can't get their needs from their regular sources. NFO has the structure to achieve collective bargaining nationwide. It makes sense, doesn't it? That's the first close. On page 13, you make your first close. It makes sense, doesn't it? Now he has seen there's hope. He's seen how he can put his production together with his neighbor and make the processors come to that block of supply. And it makes sense, doesn't it? If he says, yeah, it looks like it makes sense, you say, will you help? And if he says, yeah, okay, you sign him on the one-year or the three-year membership agreement, and you tell him, ask him, do you want the one-year or the three-year membership agreement? If he says, no, I'm not signing, nope, nope, not yet, you go to the next page. Every page now, from now on, it's a close. When government has shown it will do no more for farmers, when no one else will do a thing to raise prices, doesn't it make sense to join together with other farmers and make collective bargaining work effective? Won't you help? Uh, not yet. Nope. Go to the next page. You've got to come back. Those who have used collective bargaining have gotten a better shake. There is absolutely nothing to lose. Joe, sellers and buyers doing business through contracts that benefit both parties is the American way of doing business, isn't it? You'll have to admit it is. That's what NFO is all about. Won't you help, Joe? What do you want, a three-year or one-year membership agreement? Nope, not going to sign, not going to join yet. If he does, you don't have to go through the rest of the book. You know. But if he doesn't, you've still got two more chances. The next page, you come back again. You say, Joe, NFO doesn't buy or sell anything. NFO is a structure for farmers to join and be part of so they can bargain collectively. It's already set up to go. 30% of the nationwide volume marketed together will make processors sign contracts for it. That will give farmers cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And I'm sure you're interested in profit, aren't you? And yeah, I'm interested in profit. We just went through how processors get into a bargaining position by blocking production together, Joe. Let's try it for one year. What else is there? Isn't it about time we quit asking, what will you give me? And put our buyers in a position to say, this is the price. 
And we've just seen how we can put the buyers into that position. Joe, won't you help? Yep, I guess maybe I'd better get in there. He's thinking, but he ain't going to do it. So you got to go to the next page. You got one more chance. On this last page, you show them here's a nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery. The NFO is already set up, it's ready to go. The Green Star is the home office and contact point for buyers and processors to contact to indicate their desire to negotiate contracts for NFO members' production. You might want to go back to one of these pictures and show out what the farmers need to do on page 12, how they block the production together and make sad processors out of three and a happy one out of one of them. You're getting the processors into a position where they've got to say, hey, what do I have to do to get some of that supply? And then, go, they go, then you can go back here and say, they call this little green star and they say to the NFO home office, I want to talk about, pro about production. We've got to have some of what you got. That's what that little green star is there, and that's the contact point for processors to call when we short them their needs. The other small blocks and circles are collection points for NFO members to use to deliver their products to the buyers that have negotiated contracts for the NFO members' production. When 30% of the production in the nation is going through this system, the buyers will have no alternative but to sign contracts with farmers and the ranchers with, ran with, their, with their terms in them, cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Joe, you can see now how you and other farmers and ranchers can have an impact on raising prices to a fair level by joining together, can't you? And he is going to have to admit that he can see it, because if he doesn't admit that, with such a simple explanation, he's admitting that he can't understand something as simple as this. They're going to admit that they can see it now. now he may not join that day, but don't be discouraged, because what did you do? You got him to understand that there is another alternative besides going to Washington. That there is hope because farmers are not overproducing, because they control so much of the world production, and now they, he can see how he can do it by joining with his neighbors, shorting the processing industry over here while you're delivering over here, making them sign a contract, and then moving that production over here for a contract, cost of production plus reasonable profit. You got that across to him. He's going to think about it. One out of five is going to join. We know this. The other four is going to want to wait and see. You go back to them next week and say, what do you think about the NFO's program? They're going to go with us. Ladies and gentlemen, this works. And the best part of it is, when you knock on that door and you talk about after you introduced yourself, if you have to, and after you've talked about the weather and about the farming operation, you don't have to worry about what am I going to say next. It's all here. It's in writing. You got your whole presentation here. You don't have to deviate from it. You've got six closes. You know exactly when to close them. And after, if he doesn't join after you're done with it, you know he understands NFO a little bit better than he did before. Thank you. And Roger, turn this back to you. The simplicity of it, I want to show you exactly how simple it is. <clears throat> There's only three things you got to remember. The first one is that page in the book. You can answer all of his questions with going back to that one page. The Fall of the American Farmer. With parity year after year, being lower than it was the year before. And if that doesn't do it, you go to this one and show him that. That the U.S. farmers and ranchers produce 60% of the world's supply of soybeans. You show me one manufacturer in the world that would supply 60% of the widgets sold in this world, you tell me that he wouldn't put a price on it? If he wouldn't, we'd all think he was nuts. That's where your power is at, people. Right there. And the last thing is, ask him, will you help? It's that simple. You don't have to worry about philosophy. You don't have to worry about, they don't care what's happened. They want to know where you're at, where is that FO at today, and where are you going to go? 
You know, there was one thing when NFO came to Southeast Missouri about 18 years ago, there was a lot of people said, no, we're scared of it because it's a secret organization. That was one of the things they used against. How many of you remember that? Well, I want to tell you something. And don't take me wrong, but I think everybody in this room better think about it. Because you have got the best kept secret in American agriculture today. You know why? Those 700 young farmers told us why. You're not telling them what the chances are and what this organization has got to offer. They don't think there's any hope. That's why it's the best kept secret in agriculture. And we had better change that, people, and it's going to start right here in this 77 convention. You know, like I said earlier, if we lose, 27% of them are in trouble. 27% of the farmers, according to government statistics, are in financial trouble this year. Do you know who that is? That's the 30-year-old farmers, biggest part of them. You know, if we pull off a miracle, we're going to lose 5 to 8 to 10 percent of them by spring. It's too late. We don't do anything this winter. We wait till next year to hope that we'll come out with something that's going to be a little bit easier to go out and talk to them with. And you sit around and we lose another 10, 15 percent of them. People, there's the 30 percent that you need to get the job done. They're out there, they're almost in a state of panic because they don't know what they're going to do. Now believe me, I know it. I've been out there, I've been talking to them, I've been to meetings where they discuss it. All you've got to do is go out and ask them if they'll help and show them that there's hope. A systematic step-by-step -step project to get them cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And you know if you don't, you know what's going to happen? There was a survey done in Kansas, at Kansas State University last year, this last summer. Do you know if inflation keeps up at 6% a year from now till the year 2000, and that's what, 22 years away? Do you know where the price of stuff is going to be that we're going to have to buy? A combine that cost $40,000 today, people, is going to cost $156,000. Taking that combine at only 6% interest, pardon me, 6% inflation. And we've went through four or five years of double-digit inflation, but just say 6%. A pickup truck costing $5,500 today in the year 2000 will cost $21,450. A 75 sow fairing unit today costing $60,000 will cost $234,000. A circle irrigation system, $45,000 today, $175,000 in the year 2000. $175,000. A claw hammer that cost $4.25 when this study was run, $16.55 in the year 2000. And it goes on and on and on. Now you take, when you go back to your motel room, take a pencil and sit down and take whatever commodity you want to. 64% is what, where the parity sat in September. You take any commodity you want to, with the exception of probably sheep, and you put a pencil to that thing in proportion to what this is, and do you know, have any idea, do you have any idea where parity is going to be sitting in the year 2000? Way less than 50%. I don't care how efficient you are, it's not going to work. The study goes on to say that farm pri the price of land will go up, but there's no way it can continue to, to, to rise that fast in proportion to it. So the only answer 
is what we're talking about here. And you've got the answer, people. You've come 15 to 20 years through every problem that could possibly happen. And you got us to where we are right now. Now, I'm begging you, don't stop when you're two years away from making the thing work or maybe even less than that. Let's get the best kept secret in agriculture out and tell those young guys about it. Help me tell them about it. And you won't believe what will happen. But it's going to start right here. And if we don't get this secret out, then we are condemning American agriculture within five years. Now I want you to think about one other thing. You know, we said if we lose 10% of them this year and 10% of them next year, that's 20%. Those are the young farmers. Five years from now, how many of you in here will be ready for retirement? All right. You see what I'm talking about? Who is going to take over? They're playing a waiting game on you. They're hoping you're going to get tired and they're going to wind up with what they want. I'm asking you to do the next thing that has to be done. Go out and talk to them. And remember what I said before, you're not talking to guys. You're talking to people. You're talking to young guys who don't know what to do next. And what they need worse now than everything is hope. And show them this program and talk to them. And let's get the job done. Thank you. Well, it's awfully nice to have the crowd here again. I would like to ask you if you've been sort of mentally keeping track. This is like one of those kids' uh, pictures where you're supposed to find a certain list of articles hidden in the trees, in the grass, etc. During this program this evening, how many tools, how many NFO tools did we talk about? Now, I didn't tell you beforehand to keep track, and it didn't occur to me that that might be kind of interesting until I got to thinking myself, sitting there, how many we had. Let me mention them. But first, let me mention that these tools are no good unless they're used. Okay, we had the NFO insignias that we talked about. We had the NFO promotion materials of other kinds, the NFO sausage feeds, the NFO taped radio shows, the NFO contracts, the NFO area offices, the NFO certificate of support, the NFO membership booklet, and if you want to stretch it just a little bit, we did talk about the one-year membership agreement, the, the three-year membership agreement, the collection, dispatch, and delivery system, and I've le left the best till last, the women's activities committees. Now that's a whale of a lot of help if we will recognize that they're there and use them. Another thing that is a good tool is the literature back there. I forgot to mention that even. We have back there the Homestead Alert. There is a copy of the most recent edition that we are sending out, a little newsletter that goes out to the uh, women's activities coordinators in the counties where I have names. And that's another thing. I don't have names from all of the counties. And when January rolls around, I would hope that we would have two names from each county so that we have contact people there that we can work with. Also, there is, a re there is a yellow order sheet back there that most of you have seen before for subscriptions to the NFO reporter. This is one of the tools also that is available to us. Okay, we'll get past the, liter the tools, the literature, and the women's coordinators. I would hope that each county that is represented here would either give me names before they leave or send them to me when they get back to their committees or to their counties. 
And then I would like to ask you something that we have not talked about before, but we will talk about it in the January Women's Activities Coordinator letter. I would like for you to consider having a fundraiser in your county earmarked for the Women's Activity Committee so that when there are phone calls and mileage and uh, advertisement, any kinds of things that would be necessary of out-of-pocket money that some gal who would be willing to take the responsibility to do things, that this would be money out of her pocket. If you would have a little fundraiser in the counties and set that money aside so that there is money there to work with, this would be something that I would ask you to think about so that this would be available and you don't have to be stingy with it. If you make a pretty good little chunk of money and the county needs mileage and telephone calls for other commodities, all I'm saying is have a little bit of money available that this can be used for. Okay, now the meeting that will be held Thursday, I have a transparency set that I have, many of you, I know some of the people I see here, I know you've seen it because I've been using it this year, kind of test marketing it see how it would work out and how it would fill the need. This transparency set is on the basics of NFO and would be suitable to show to prospective members or inactive wives, and I'm going to say wives here because if they're inactive, they don't consider themselves members yet. It would be suitable to use for church groups or civic groups, just anybody that would be interested in knowing what the NFO is and what we're trying to do. It's not complicated but it does cover the kinds of things that most people would like to know about us. So that would be available then on Thursday. We didn't have that tonight. And those of you who have seen it, I'm not going to ask you to sit through it again, but I would ask you to see some other people come in to the meeting on Thursday so that we can use it then. Okay, I promised you guys something. Now you're going to get it. Those fellows who are at the convention without their wives have given themselves a severe handicap. How can you go home and try to relate to her five days or four days or three or two or even one of what went on at the convention? And this happens in a smaller way all year. Any NFO meeting that you go to and you don't take your wife along, when you go home, you either have to try to retell it or ignore it. And either way, she comes out on the short end. Now, what happens when you get into a conversation with someone and they bring up a subject that you don't know much about? You kind of wish they'd hurry up and get on to something else, don't you? The wives who don't go to NFO meetings are dependent on you to show and tell when you get home or else go without and not know what's going on. Now put yourself in her position. If she doesn't know about NFO, then she has only a feeling of being an outsider. Did you ever think of that? She knows a lot about production. She knows a lot about the farm, the farmer system, because that's the way it always has been done. And she will resist the unknown. And she'll resent the time and the effort that you take to further this thing that she doesn't know much about. Now, you can talk about women's lib all you want to, but I know farm gals well enough that they're too busy to be much concerned about that and they don't have an identity problem. They know perfectly well where they fit. But we do have a situation where these gals want the encouragement and approval of their helpmate before they will step out and do something different. And NFO is different. Most farm organizations are men's organizations, or at least they appear to be. And if you doubt it, or if you don't get the point, they have an auxiliary set up as a counterpart. So the image of farm organizations is that of a man's organization. So in any given area, unless 
that particular county started out with a lot of women being active and coming to the meetings so that it was a customary thing. You have counties where there are very few women going to the meetings. And I dare say that county is probably not a very well-functioning county. Farm wives are like other wives. They're not silent partners. And if they don't understand what's going on, then your membership has an awful handicap. How can you fulfill it if you can't both understand it and work with it? Now, if two people go to a meeting, no two people hear the same thing. I'll remember one thing, you'll remember something else. But if you can communicate after that meeting is over, you're both going to have learned twice as much as you would have if you'd have gone by yourself and can't discuss it. So when you do go home from a meeting and you try to tell her what's going on and she, you know, sort of gives you the fish eye, well, then the wind is out of your sails and you're not going to go talk to your neighbor. And that's the whole solution. We, you, we have to go talk to our neighbor. But if you don't get past the old girl, you're not going to go talk to the neighbor. It's a self-defeating situation. So it's like this. If you ask her to go to a meeting several times, pretty soon she's going to get the idea that this is something that's important to you. And she'll make time for it. And it will be a gradual process, but she will become informed about NFO. She'll become interested in it. And it'll be a family affair. It'll be something you can talk about. And when she understands that she is half of the human resources in agriculture, she will want to be part of it. But as long as you leave her home, she's an outsider. And we don't need someone in the organization's um, make, makeup that feels like an outsider. She is a part of that farm or ranch operation. She's a partner. She is also a partner in the membership agreement, whether her name is on the contract or not. It can be, and I hope that eventually this will be the case. But she has all the rights and privileges, the voting privileges, with no extra fanfare whatsoever. And many of these wife groups, or concerned farm wives, or uh, women for survival of agriculture, many, many different groups are springing up, and most of them are expressing the fut futile feeling and the hopelessness of having no ability to do something about the farm problem in the circumstances they were living in. And here we are, the great shining difference, you know, all 20 years, and they don't know that they could fit into it. Yeah, best kept secret, that's a good way to put it. We've done every, when we talk to ourselves, you would think that we've done everything but hire a band, wouldn't you? <laughs> but we're just talking to ourselves and, and we don't expand that way. That is unless you guys are talking to your wives and you haven't been before. So I would like to say encourage her so that she feels like a member instead of a member's wife. There is uh, another thing that I would like to mention as I'm looking over the crowd. There are more people here over 30 than there are under 30. And we've probably got about the same kind of a mix. Now this 30 is no magic, you know, no magic age. But all of the things that Schlotick and Arndt were telling you are things that we have discovered are true simply because we've been keeping track of, of the records. But the people who are here are still the right people because they are here. I remember earlier this fall, I was to a meeting in uh, Northeast Missouri, and I had been talking with some of the older people there, and you'll find these guys, you know, that have got 20, 21 years, stars on their membership, and it occurred to me that some of them thought of themselves as guinea pigs and some of them thought of themselves as pioneers. And there's kind of a difference, you know. One is sort of positive and the other is sort of negative. But if you stop and think about it, we're a little of each. We darn sure were pioneers, but we've sure been guinea pigs. But who else were we going to practice on? We had the production. 
You can't practice on people in Omaha or Des Moines or Kansas City or Seattle, you know, because they did not have production. It had to be us. And we are the people, I'm proud to say that my membership agreement has got 14 years on it now, and I don't think it's near time to give up and let somebody else take a hold of it. I think that all of us who have contributed something to the organization has not only a right but a responsibility to get a second wind and take off with it again this winter. If you say you're tired and all like that, well, you've had your rest. <laughs> this winter is the time that we need all the help we can get. And when we sit around this winter, instead of talking about history, let's talk about what's happening right now in this county, whatever it happens to be. You know, we can only bargain with that production that is signed up right now. It doesn't really matter at this point. It did at one time, and it's the kind of thing that built the organization to what it's at. But it doesn't really matter how many people threw a hat, I mean, threw a dollar in the hat in the 50s. With all due respect to the people in the Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska area where this thing was started in the 50s, with all due respect to them, it doesn't really matter anymore. And it doesn't really matter anymore how many memberships we signed in the 1960s when we spread this country like a prairie fire. It doesn't really matter how many holding actions we had. And getting a little closer to the present, it doesn't really matter how many lawsuits we've survived in the 70s. Those things were all well and good, but they're all history and they are the basics. And we're right down now, though, to what production do we have? All of these things that went before, we could have just as well not bothered if we don't take the end result that we have today and make it do what it can do. The only measure of maturity that we have at this day and time is production, nothing else. No matter how, what else we do, what really makes the difference and the only thing that moves the price is production, nothing else. So we've built it, we've got it, but if we don't put that label on the success, the production and the price, then we've done this 20 years of labor for, uh, for the fun of it or for the exercise. And I don't think any of us have put in the effort these many years that would be willing to sac sacrifice this opportunity or let it go because of default. And every one of us have as much responsibility as the next person. There was a little story that John Cook told in Michigan here this winter that I think is kind of a, a little relief. And when you're trying to explain to somebody what we're talking about, about pricing the products, the fellow says to John, and if you know John Cook, you know his, his marvelous little German accent, John, I sold my grain, but I didn't get any money. John says, I asked him, well, then why did you sell your grain? John, because I needed the money. Okay, this is the situation we're in, and we have a way out. It's kind of like I've got some bad news and I've got some good news. You know, I guess when they tell the story, they say, I've got some good news and some bad news. Isn't that right? Okay, the good news is that you have what you need. You have the production. These guys from Kansas, boy, have you got the production, huh? We've got the production and we've got the Capra Volstead Act. That's all you need. You don't need additional legislation. You don't need the goodwill of the consumer. There are any kind of things. You know, they can feed to you probably for 24 hours straight all the reasons why you can't get a price. But you have what you need if you just ignore the rest of that. You've got the production, you've got the Capra Volstead Act. And those two things will get us a price if we'll put the two of them together. And on this membership drive that we have this winter, I think the difference between success and failure will be in our own mental attitude, how we see ourselves. I would like for you just a minute to think. Did you ever, did you ever consider yourself as a very unique individual in your township or your community? You have an ability that nobody else 
except another NFO member, of course, has. It's a matter of pride if you put it in perspective. An NFO member is the only person that can drive on a farm or ranch and offer a solution to this cost price squeeze. If a guy drives on that farm and offers to buy production, he is going to buy it within that range that the operator or owner of that farm already can't stand yet, you know. He's going to contribute to that cost price squeeze. If a guy drives on that farm or ranch and offers to sell something to this guy, He's going to sell it to him at this inflated rate that Roger was talking about a little while ago. And he also will contribute to the cost price squeeze that this guy already can't live with. The only person that can come on that man's place and offer him a way out is an NFO member. You can offer that man a solution to his cost price problem and you can offer him an opportunity to ensure his future against getting into the same bind again, if he'll take it. An NFO member is the only person that can do that. Doesn't that sort of do something for you? We are people who have, maybe if you want to uh, compare it maybe to what the early Christians had. It was something that was special something that was worthwhile. And if we will see ourselves as a solution to this guy's problem, we are our brother's keeper. What we're doing is right and just. We have to be selfish enough to want it for ourselves and unselfish enough to work with others to get it. And we can be proud of what we have and our very... To, uh, how should I say it? It, it? To me, it's overwhelming. I've been in this outfit a long time, and I still get goosebumps when I hear some of our people trying to get themselves across to others. And every person, every NFO member can do that to his neighbor. And those of us that work on the staff can only reach so many people. And the ones that we see are supposed to be just the top, you know, like, like the ocean. You just see the top of it. And those people that are on the top are the ones who can contact the rest in a very short period of time. We have a marvelous opportunity that you built, that I built, and the people who had to stay home on their farms and yet are NFO members and participating members that they have built. You have part of the solution right there in your hands and I hope that you will look at it and give some serious consideration to being part of it. And now, this has been coverage of the NFO ladies meeting at the 1977 NFO convention at Omaha, Nebraska. The ladies slogan, we are full partners in agriculture and in membership in the National Farmers Organization. Phil Allen for NFO News and that for today is something to think about.